Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on John Keats's ode called To Autumn. All right. Now this ode belongs to one of the six major odes by John Keats. And it is one of the last of the six odes. All right. So it is a very important one. And among the other odes of John Keats are Ode to Psyche, Ode to the Nightingale, to a Nightingale. Ode on a Grecian urn. Etc. All right. So you see, to autumn is a very important poem. Because uh, it was composed during the last years of Keats's life. It was composed in 1819 and it was published in 1820. All right. Now. In 1819, Keats wrote to his friend, whose name is John Hamilton. John Hamilton. He wrote in a letter, uh, John Hamilton Reynolds. Sorry. Uh, he wrote to his friend Reynolds about the scene which inspired him and here Keats wrote how beautiful the season is now how fine the air a temperate sharpness about it really without joking chaste weather the and skies I never liked stubble fields so much as now I better than the chilly green of the spring somehow a stubble field looks warm in the same way that some pictures look warm. This struck me so much in my Sunday's walk that I composed upon it. So basically what Keats does over here is that he is explaining to Reynolds that what his basic idea is behind composing this poem. And look, this is one of those poems which is uh, very sensual. This is a uh, very, very image laden. This is full of synesthesia. Okay, so what is synesthesia? Synesthesia is a Keatsian term which talks about the kind of mood evoking uh, use of words. Okay. Now it describes the season of autumn in three stanzas. Okay. Now each of the stanzas have 11 lines. So altogether there are 33 lines in the poem and all of them are in a rhyme scheme which is a b a b so it is alternate rhyming look ness bless sun run trees core shells more so on and so forth now keats over here develops the idea of autumn as a female goddess and then moves on with the same idea of the goddess through a homemaker a commoner and autumn is feminized in this poem via keats in multiple ways and we shall 
try to understand them okay there is a mourning over here as well there is a little bit of mourning at the loss of spring but autumn is being celebrated in a very beautiful way so let us read the poem and try to understand okay so season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatches run first let us read these four lines now you see the first sentence season of mists and mellow fruitfulness so the season is in wrapped with mists so there is a lot of mystery in this season the season is an enigma it is covered in mists and mellow fruitfulness the word mellow is very significant over here because it kind of tones down the exuberance of spring and brings to autumn a very calm homely uh, expression mellow fruitfulness so there is an abundance in nature and it is this abundance in nature which is very significant over here so season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun now look when keats says the maturing sun it is a very interesting way of talking about uh the season because you see the sun goes through several circles in the course of the year and with that the extent of days become longer or shorter than so on and so forth so keats refers to the diurnal and the seasonal circle and locates autumn in almost like a map pointing in the year in the among the seasons now look if you look at these lines you will see that there is a celebration of autumn the gorgeous long vowel imagery which accompanies the writing and it keeps on referring to abundance look season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatches run so here we have very beautiful uh, long vowel expressions of abundance and the long vowels kind of show a mood of indolence and it is this mood of indolence that comes after abundance so look close bosom friend as if the season is a bosom friend is a very close friend of the sun itself conspiring with him how to load and bless so first the season is an enigma it is shrouded in mystery and now it is conspiring with the sun on not how to uh, create destruction or wreak havoc but on how to load and bless so as if it is a season of blessings it is a season where everything is loaded so load and bless and in this word bless remember i said that autumn is portrayed as a goddess so autumn is being seen as a goddess a goddess who is close bosom friend of the maturing sun and if you look at Uh, the greek tradition then apollo was the god of the sun and there are multiple stories about apollo's love in uh, the greek tradition in the greek myths so conspiring with him how to load and bless and here there is this goddess image now according to greek tradition there was a goddess of harvest whose name was 
Ceres or Demeter. So there might be a reference to that as well. With fruit, the vines that round the thatchives run. Thatchiv. So this is for the first time. Here we have a reference to human creation. Up till now, we were talking about autumn and nature. First, in the thatchiv, that is the uh, basically the covering on the houses in the rural houses that is called thatchiv. So with fruit, the vines round that round the thatchivs run. So the vines, the trees, the fruits, everything gets an abundance during this season. To bend with apples the most cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel to set budding more. Look, to bend with apples the most cottage trees. So the cottage trees which are being overwhelmed by moss. So the most cottage trees is look, the trees are not only getting all the nutrition, but the parasites also, the mosses, they are also getting all the nutrition and the cottage trees are bending with apples. So there is so much of abundance. Now, this period for Keats, he was suffering from tuberculosis during this time. And this was the beginning of his own end. But instead of giving in to melancholy, Keats went through a period of uh, fruitfulness, a very fruitful period of existence. And there is this inherent energy and uh, beauty in the poem, which can be very easily seen. No, you see also there are tinges of melancholy here and there, which as we come, we will uh, talk about them. And look, then fill all fruit with ripeness to the core. And you know, in King Lear, in Shakespeare's King Lear, William Shakespeare's famous play, King Lear, there is a famous speech which says, ripeness is all. So it is the maturity, the ripeness in the seasons that is being shown by autumn. And fill all fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells. Hazel shells? Hazelnuts. To swell the gourd and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, that is the nut itself, to set budding more. As if nature is getting impregnated by the bounty of the sun. Now, here I would ask you to go to the internet and look at a painting, Botticelli's Venus. This is a painting you can easily watch it on google and there you will see that how venus is plump with a child she's pregnant and this impregnation image is there as well and here also we see that same impregnating image and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease for summer has over brimmed their clammy cells now look, autumn comes with a bounty, a beauty, the benison of nature. And this more and more, this over exuberance that is being seen in autumn creates a sense of the undepletable 
bounty of nature and as if the natural beings are also confused that perhaps this bounty shall not cease but here the melancholic undertone remains that the bounties will cease just like Keats will soon succumb to his tuberculosis and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease for summer has overdreamed their clammy cells so it is like the beehive the beehive is clammed with honey so it is overflowing it's overpouring and it is this exuberance this abundance this over uh, pour that is what is important in autumn so this was the first stanza and now look keats resorts to something which is called personification He tries to personify autumn itself. What is personification? When an inanimate object or something of that sort is given personal traits. And look now, Keats directly addresses autumn. Who had not seen the oft? Oft means often. Who had not seen the oft amid thy store? Store means abundance. Sometimes whoever seeks abroad, abroad means outside, not out of the country, may find this sitting careless on a granary floor. Now, why is the autumn or why is the gleaner uh, careless? Because of the abundance of the crops on a granary floor. Thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. Winnowing means parting. So the wafting breeze kind of takes her hair and kind of blows it slowly and softly or on a half ripped furrow sound asleep drowsed with the fume of poppies while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers this is a very interesting image you see, uh, because in this image, uh, we have a farmer and the farmer is, uh, has taken a scythe and in a poppy field, he is using the scythe like this to cut the crop. But now with the smell of poppies and the slowly wafting wind and the breeze the farmer has fallen asleep because he knows that there is an abundance and in this abundance what happens is that the farmer has forgotten to do his work and therefore as if he has spared the rest of the crops from the next sway of his kite so this is the image that Keats is trying to portray over here all right but here you will see that something is very interesting uh there was a romantic painter whose name was john constable john constable's landscape paintings are very very beautiful okay uh especially uh there is one called the cornfield i think you can check some of constable's paintings and see for yourself what keats is trying to hint at because his paintings are equally beautiful and uh, this creates a sense of synergy with keats and look what happens over here is that the feeling of freedom is being shown in the second stanza that is he does not view autumn from that same perspective but opens up his gaze and looks at the season from a variety of points of view 
and personifies the season itself to make it easier for his readers to empathize with the season that he is so painstakingly bringing to life. And therefore, uh, in the second stanza, the autumn is viewed as a fertile female goddess on the one hand, and on the other hand, as commoners. Uh, however, there remains a hint of cruelty uh, over here, like in another poem of Keats, which is called uh, La Belle Dem Sans Mercy. La Belle Dem. La Belle Dem Sans Mercy. Means the beautiful lady without thanks. La means the, Bell means beautiful, Dame means woman or young girl, Sans means without, Mercy means thanks. So he, Keats has a dichotomy where beautiful women with an age of cruelty are uh, presented. Uh, with cruelty to them, which is uh, replete in his poetry, because Keats himself perhaps was unlucky in love, and uh, so he kind of used these images of women who were on the verge of cruelty or who were themselves going through something like that, is being represented. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook. So a gleaner is someone who kind of uh, carries something. Uh, and sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady, uh, steady thy laden head across a brook. So imagine there is a brook, a small waterway, and on that there is a plank. And the gleaner has to carry something from this side to this side. And the gleaner is carrying something on her shoulders like this. OK. So here is something, and here is something. So the gleaner has to keep his head steady in order for him to balance the weight on a small plank. So sometimes like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook. Or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Look, what happens in this image is that a cider press is where you create wine or even um such stuff as wine uh so or by a cider press what does a cider press do it's like a press where you squeeze the juice out of the apples or other fruits with patient look and a cider press usually uh creates the juice drop by drop so it's a lot of patience a lot of patience is needed for one to kind of uh go through the cider press and all. So with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings hours by hours. So just like life matures step by step, drop by drop, similarly here through the cider press, the oozings happen drop by drop. And it is this drop by drop maturity, it is this step by step maturity that is very important over here. All right, so we will finish here today. And in the next class, we will complete the text itself. All right, thank you so much.